Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Today we're joined by Dr. Tom van der Stocken. He's a postdoc at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Uh, Tom has his PhD in physical geography and ecology from the Free University of Brussels, and his research looks at the global distribution of mangrove carbon stocks. So he's going to share some of that work with us today uh, with mangroves in a changing world. So welcome, Tom. I'd like to start by thanking the Institute for having me. It's a real honor. You guys are really lucky to work here. Like, I work in it. I see cubicles. You guys see the ocean. That's, that's the difference. And so today we'll, we'll go to the ocean side. Not really the ocean, but the intertidal zone. And I will talk about mangroves in a changing world. Discuss some methods and techniques that we use to study the dispersal of these plants by ocean currents. Um, something that is really challenging, and I'll, I'll show you why uh, as well. To give you, I'll give you a glimpse of the ecosystem because I assume not everyone may be familiar with with mangroves. Who, who in the audience knows mangroves? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> End of the talk. Thanks. <laughs> no, so, I'll I'll start with this. This is a question that I've been receiving many times, like I used to work as a glaciologist and today I work on mangrove ecosystems. So I go from the high latitudes to the tropics. And after my masters, I've been working on Antarctica, subglacial hydrology, and people were like, what are you working on mangroves now? Like you go from the high latitudes to the tropics, like that's, that's kind of a temperature difference. And I was lying awake every day, like, why, how should I explain this? Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a shift, right? But it's basically pretty simple. It's all about change. Like, there, there's the, re the retreat of glaciers globally. There's, everywhere in the world we see that glaciers, Antarctica, there's parts that are, it's constantly moving. And the same happens with mangroves. Everything in life is changing. And it started 4.6 billion years ago. Everything on this planet is in constant change. And that's what I'm attracted by. Some of you in the audience may know, like I have some friends here, and they know that time is my favorite dimension. It's also the most romantic dimension, I think. Because it reminds us that not everything, you should not take everything for granted. Everything we have now is, there's change. I mean, I'm, I'm moving now. I'm, I'm changing the energy in the room. Particles here, atoms are, are constantly on the move. And that's the same there, whether it's a glacier or mangrove ecosystems or a bird migrating from Southern California to the North. It's, to me, it's all about processes. And that's what I'm attracted by. So that's my answer to this question. And this is a map from a recent study and they looked at the change in the distribution of species, terrestrial species, marine species. And what we see is that there's a shift in all those ranges due to global warming. But global warming is not the only thing. It's not just temperature, the average temperature that is rising. Changing temperatures is changing precipitation conditions. It's changing soil conditions. There's like all these processes that are interacting constantly. And that's a very intriguing thing. I mean, we're on a very unique planet. And if you look at that map, that's, I mean, I'm kind of intrigued by the whole picture. And there's mangroves as well, which is here. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into detail later for this. But what I want to show is species are adapted to what, what I, would say, I would simplify to as preferred environmental conditions. We prefer a certain temperature. If you would put us on Antarctica, actually we would die. We wouldn't make it long there. But we have nice coats. We have Gore-Tex. We we, we've been changing and inventing a lot of stuff that allows us to go there for a longer time. But naturally, that's not where we thrive. And these preferred conditions are, are, are changing. I mean, the whole window that is preferred by a species is shifting, typically to higher latitudes or to, to deeper depths, let's say. And that's what we see here. If you, we look at the latitudinal gradient here, and at the northern edge, we see that at the higher latitudes, when there's warming, those areas that were previously too cold become suitable climatologically. 
in, at the southern latitudes where it was sufficiently warm, it becomes too warm. And you have this gradual process where species were present and now they get extinct, but at the northern edge, you see like species appearing. And it's a gradual process. It, ha it happens gradually over time. And typically you see that it's a latitudinal thing, and I will continue saying that, from the south to the north or to deeper depths. For example, here, if you look at the ocean temperature, so this is ocean depth with latitude, and you see like a shift where normally this was the 20 degree isotherm, it's, it has moved a bit deeper, but also to a higher latitude. On average, why do I say that? Because reality is more complex. It's not just a unidirectional thing. There's precipitation, there's temperature, there's salinity, there's uh, soil conditions, and all those things interact. And that makes it a much more complex pattern than what I've shown before. This is a study of about 500 birds in Australia. And if you combine all the climatologic uh, factors that influence these species, look at it, that's not unidirectional. So this just to say, it's not a very simple thing. But if we go to mangroves, and I will come to that later, mangroves thrive in the intertidal zone, which is basically a very narrow strip in between the land and the ocean. So there's not a lot of space to, to go, right? I mean, here you can kind of go over a continent, not taking into account mountain ranges and deserts, whatever. But mangroves have this narrow strip, and if sea level rises, where to go? Well, we can go inland. But today, inland, we know that in many cases, there's buildings, there's dikes, and so there is what I call the coastal squeeze, and I will come to that later. There's not only changes in species or in one species, people can say, yeah, why, why does it matter, like this single species? Well, in a community, species are interacting, so shifts in one species cause shifts in other species. And this is just an example to show you, it, it's called the tropicalization of the uh, temperate region where this particular fish species, which is grazing on kelp forest, increased over time because of the warming of the waters. And what you see here, so those grazers, they increased, but the kelp forest disappeared. And the, here, are so, here are some images. So this is the same location, kelp forest in 1990, raised away gradually, and today we find corals there. So the whole system changed. And that's something that I wanna really, I mean, I don't have to convince you, but it's just something that is asked regularly, like why are people focusing on this single species? Well, it's just, it's more than one species. You have this whole network, and tuning that single species has changes in the whole network. And that's important with mangroves too. You can say, oh, let's just deforest and what, why, why should we matter? I mean, why care? But we'll see corals are also connected to mangroves. Seagrass is connected to mangroves. Humans are connected to mangroves. And I'll show you that later. So this is about species range shifts and it's, uh, it's a global thing. It, it's constantly happening papers enough about that, but also mangroves are moving. I would say mangroves on the move. There has been an increasing amount of papers reporting this, and especially in Florida, we see a northward shift of mangroves along the coast because of warming. And most of the studies have focused on climatic factors, mainly temperature and precipitation. But in all those studies, people are talking about dispersal. That's what we're missing still. Because it's not because habitat is becoming available north of us that we can get there. Maybe I just don't get there. Maybe I have no seeds to bring there. So that's what we need to study. And that's, that's the bottom line of this talk. Because I'm going to talk about dispersal in mangrove systems and why that matters. Well, here it is. This is why it matters. We need this information to combine it with climatic data to see how globally this whole forest system will shift under future conditions. For those who don't know mangroves, here it is. So when we talk about mangroves, we're in the tropics and subtropics in the intertidal zone. It's a very dynamic system, um, what you see here. 
So this is just tidal flat. These are all mangroves. And then when the tide comes in, and I think the next one showed, shows it more beautifully, there's this forest and the tides come in and out, exporting nutrients, importing nutrients, carbon, phosphorus. I mean, there's this whole flux of nutrients from that system to the ocean and vice versa. And I found this 17th century um, herbarium from Rumfuse. It was, uh, it was my PhD supervisor who sent it to me. We, we both like old books and I was very charmed by this uh, herbarium because this is in Latin and here it's in old Dutch. So I kind of understand what it says because it resembles Flemish. And if you translate it, this is what it says. And it, it's, it's a very poetic way of describing mangroves. And I especially like, so it's beech trees seeing in turns under their branches at moments the dry land, then the water. And I love that very much because that's 17th century, someone with a totally different perspective describing for one of the first times this particular system in a period of colonization. And this is what it looks like. Just to say that it's challenging to do field work there, going through that, I think if you like Indiana Jones, and I like Indiana Jones, this is perfect because you can hang in the trees. You, yeah, there's, there's something to do there. But it can also be totally different. And by the way, those roots, we call them pneumatophores. And the previous one, the previous slides were prop roots. These are pencil roots because they stick out of the ground like little pencils. You have knee roots because if you look like this, well, look like this with the, it's, it's like a little knee sticking out. And this, this is in the um, more landward zone. This, these are pencil roots as well. So you see it's a very diverse system. You go from the water side inland, there's a totally different type of root systems, tidal height and so forth. Why are mangroves important? Well, I mean, we can talk about this for an hour, definitely. But one of the things is fish like it because it, it's a perfect breeding ground it gives protection, but it's also important for local communities. They use the wood for as timber wood for building their houses and stuff. So this is, this is a picture taken in Africa in the village where I used to, to work. And so those people depend on those systems and they also have plantations. So they cut part of the forest, but they also plant part of the forest. And there's this thing from Del Taras where they are experimenting with mangrove trees and you see like a wave coming in and the energy is dissipated, and here you see nothing of the water is moving. So they, it's, it's a perfect system for coastal protection and flood control. And it has been proven by the 2004 or five tsunami in, on, in the, uh, 2004, right? December 2004, where we could see that in Sri Lanka, along the coast, parts of the coast that had mangroves were le much less damaged than parts of the coast that had no mangroves because these dense root systems, they block the waves, they dissipate the energy, and they stabilize the coast. And, and so that's one of the main advantages. And definitely as well, it stores four times more carbon than other tropical forests because of it, its particular setting, suboxic conditions, where sediments are cap captured and trapped. And yeah, that's definitely a unique thing where I, where I would talk about as well. So why the carbon? Because changes in mangrove area changes the carbon stocks. And we're at this very moment trying to connect the mangrove system with the ocean biogeochemistry together with Dustin Carroll, who is in the audience. And our idea is to translate the whole global mangrove forest area into a carbon stock and release that into the ocean. And that's why we are using these very recent studies. So I was part of this study where we connected uh, global canopy structure with precipitation. And we can see that changes in precipitation change the whole forest structure, which is also a very exciting thing when you think about changes in temperature causing changes in precipitation, regional precipitation patterns. And there is expansion in salt marshes. This is in St. Augustine, in Florida, where we see that warming causes mangroves to shift northward, but often at the expense of salt marshes. So there's a change in habitat functioning as well. 
And that's also an interesting thing that we should take into account. It's not because mangroves move northward and we say, hey, there's more mangroves. Well, it's, it, it has a cost in another ecosystem. And this is the coastal squeeze that I've been talking about. So you see, it's a narrow strip. We can go in inland. We've seen that with the last glacial maximum using paleontology. We see that with the drop of sea level, mangroves appear also in the intertidal zone, but just more, uh, well, more downstream, let's say, because it's lower. But in this area, the human area, we have this. So if sea level rises, you have a stress coming in here and a stress blocking here. Like it, it's just squeezed in between. And we have examples in Texas of landward migration, but in other areas, definitely not. Um, so and that's, that's also something that I would like you to realize. That causes the loss of mangroves. We see all those changes globally, and there's a gain of mangroves due to warming, but there's also a loss of mangroves. And that's, that's why today we want to study how these systems are connected to other ecosystems. Because if, if it's really that bad, we need to anticipate to future changes. Um, this is for those who like shrimps. So this is, a sh this is the former mangrove forest here. And warm water shrimps are, well, these are just all ponds. So the whole forest is just cut to have warm water shrimps in. in. It's a, I like the image because it says something. It's not just a small pond. It's, it's a huge forest that is being cut. Um, this is one that I visited in Kenya. So it's abandoned now because they use, well, they use different things like antibiotics. And after a while, you cannot use it anymore. And they just abandon it. And that, that's where it is. And so changes in mangrove forest is not only impacting the ecosystem itself, ecosystem health, but also climate, as I said, changes in carbon stocks and human well-being because people, local communities, depend on these systems. They're far from us. Maybe here in California, you're more familiar with mangroves than we are in Europe. We have no mangroves. But so it's, it seems far away, but it definitely is important for many people on this planet. And so it's also connected to seagrass. People look at it in a very isolated way, but if you, if you look at the fluxes between all those systems, I can tell you if you take away some species in one part, it just it has influences on coral systems because some coral fish go to the mangroves for protection, for uh, breeding and so forth. And it's, it's, it's the whole network that you have to look at. And so now we're going to dive into the dispersal part. How do mangroves disperse? Well, they have these, what we call propagules. I, I use propagules because it's seeds, fruits, seeds within fruits. So in, rather than using that, I just use propagules. That means dispersal unit. And they hang on these trees. You see them hanging there. This is for a rhizophora. And they can either, either plant directly or they can just fall on the ground. And with high tide, they can be taken by the currents, exported, and they're floating in the ocean. And that's where it becomes tr difficult, right? Because you're like, yeah, we, we can study these things by looking at them locally, but you cannot just take a boat and follow millions of seats in the ocean. And like, yeah, because there's a bunch there and it's impossible. And they have different shapes and sizes. Like this is for isophora. This is Cereops, this is Brugiera, Heritiera, Sonerasia, Xylocarpus. These are really cannonball-like structures. If you open them, there's like eight or ten of these inside, and they all float. And as I said, dispersal, it's easy to study if you look at the short distance. Most of the seeds disperse over short distances. You've seen those road, uh, root systems. They fall in there, there's retention by the roots, or they plant immediately. That's an easy thing. Well, apart from the, the, the part where you have to climb in the trees, but that's, that's the cool part. This is the challenging part, the long distance part. So that's typically rare. I'm not convinced that it's rare, but this is what literature says. I, I think that's much more long distance dispersal than people think. And it's hard to quantify, but it's, a very, it's, it's definitely of conservation concern, given what I've shown you before. And so in this talk, I'm going to 
we're going to look at some techniques on how to study this whole dispersal kernel, both the short distance part and the long distance part. And so there's different techniques. We use, we need to quantify the propagule traits, their buoyancy, their viability. That's what we do in mesocosms and, and like in these huge baths. This is one in Malaysia. There's these uh, flume racetracks where we can control water flow, wind conditions, and so forth. We have ocean models, we have genetics, and we have release recapture experiments. That's the Indiana Jones experiments there. <laughs> so we start in a forest. Very dense root systems, but the tides is coming in and out. So you need, definitely, you need to look at the tides. Don't go in the forest at random because, yeah, running out is not an option. It's climbing out. Or I, I, I remember stories from a colleague who had to sit in a tree on a branch waiting until low tide because the tide was coming in. I like that story. <laughs> I would have liked taking pictures of it. So this is the flume racetrack at Neos in Irseke. And what you see here, there's water flowing. Let, let's go and have a top view. So this is a conveyor belt that is rotating and it's pushing the water through this whole thing. And it's streamlined by these uh, PVC tubes. And there's a start section here. And we have also a 3D positioning system and an acoustic velocimeter here to measure the water velocity very accurately. And then there's, here is like a window you can, you can look through to see what, what's happening. Seeds floating there, we can trace them, we can take pictures of them and so forth. And of course, you need a forest. So we mimic the forest using bamboo sticks. This, this is my father's work. He likes, he likes carpenting, so we did it together. And yeah, don't, don't, don't look at this. This is why the pointer sometimes goes like this. <laughs> That's coffee, coffee cups. And so what we did here is use different root densities. And we let seeds float. We would release them here at the start and let them propagate through this whole thing and measure the time they need to, to go for all those different species. And then we would quantify that just to have an idea about what's happening there. But of course, you have ex situ experiments, control conditions, but you also want the complexity of the field. So we always combine those experiments with intra-forest experiments, in situ experiments, where we would release propagules which we painted. It's uh, biodegradable. It's the best we can do. Um, and we give them numbers, and, and then, then, come, then comes a part that I like. So we release propagules in each of those zones where, with different root types. The water comes in here and goes out like this. And you need to know that south here, if you would look on top of the canopy there, there's the ocean here at this side. So waves come in in the tidal creek, but also a bit from the south. There's a, there's a bit of a shift. And you'll see that why, why I mentioned this. These are circular statistics. So you release the seeds, and then after one tide, you go and look for them. After two tides, three tides, and so forth. Very nice job to do. And then you put them in the statistics. And what you see is you, you see like a dominant direction here and a dominant direction here. And here as well, you see that coming back. So if only focus on the thick lines. And that's basically because it follows the flood tide and the ebb tide. But now we have an idea about how far do they travel within that forest system? Are they exported to the ocean, yes or no? And we keep track of those data because that's wh what we need later for um, fine tuning our models. And this is also what we found. Not, not very surprising, but we need to quantify it. And it's this typical leptokurtic, left skewed kernel where we have a lot of short distance dispersal. And then a few make it out of the forest. There's some that went like further than 300 meters. Not a big deal. I mean, that's, that's not a challenging thing. What's challenging is what I will show later. But then there's this one thing. So now we're out of the forest. There's the complex forest system. Now we're in the open water. And then people say, well, they're hydrophorous seeds. So we look at the water currents. But I was a physical geographer coming to a biology lab. And I had like these very basic questions. Like I, I didn't even know what a mangrove plant was before. I, I knew what glaciers were, but definitely not mangroves. 
And this is what I saw in the Mediterranean Sea, like Falella Falella. You also have um, Fisalia Fisalis, whom, whom you may know, like the Portuguese man of war. And these are mangrove seeds from Heritiera, and they have these dorsal keel. And I was like, wow, that, that's pretty cool. There's like small sailing boats. They, they really float on top of the water column, very light. And you could see when the wind blows, they go perpendicular on the wind. And they're like, I just love this. So I was like, yeah, it's water currents, but we also need to look at the wind conditions. There's more than one factor. So let's build like a wind tunnel on top of the water. This is not my dad who made it. <laughs> we did this at NEOS. And so this is what comes out of it. I, don't, I will focus on only one that makes it more digestible. So what we did there is one water flow velocity, 0.3 meters a second. We did that for different ones. And we used like wind in the same direction as the water opposite direction for different wind velocities, different water velocities. And what comes out of it is physically very I mean, it's, it's just basic things, right? I mean, once it goes underwater, there's no influence anymore. But you have this whole range of seed morph morphotypes. You need to quantify it again. And there's very surprising things that come out of it. Let's just look at it. So here you see all the seed types increasing density of the seed. This is the velocity, dispersal velocity of the seeds. Water velocity here was 0.3 meters a second, and you see that the green, the green dots like this one, there was no wind here. So more or less we stick to the 0.3 meters a second. There is some variability because the seeds, they rotate and they do, they do many crazy things. And just, just see what happens here. If we just assume water currents, look at it, how, how much this sea type was influenced by the wind compared to this one. Here, this one is nearly not influenced. And it's the vertically floating, it's a Cereops propagulis, vertically floating. They start floating horizontally, but then due to anatomical changes, they start to float vertically, and then they sink. Sometimes they refloat. We didn't quantify that yet. There's a ton of stuff that we still need to do. But definitely, we capture some important processes that, that we might have overlooked if we would say, well, skip the wind. No, winds are cool, definitely for those who like sailing. Again, we went to the field. We like indoors, but we definitely like outdoors. So we went to Kenya in the same forest. It's, it's, one, it's one campaign, so we didn't take the airplane 20 times. All the field experiments were done during just lower the carbon footprint. And just to show you what we did here was painted like 900 seeds with different tags, different numbers, and we released them in different parts of the forest, like here in the forest, in the tidal creek, a bit more to the open water, and then in the, in the bay area. So this is, you see the forest here. This is the Indian Ocean. And there's a coral reef here, which sometimes is exposed at low tide. And so we released them there, and this is our walk. I just tracked it with, with the GPS. And it looks simple, but if you zoom in on that little square there, whoops, I, oops, there it is. So if you zoom in there, this is what you see. So you should see that everywhere where there's a line. So we start by, by collecting seeds. We, how do we do that? How do we select the seeds? Well, we shake a tree because we want to mature seeds. We collect them. Then we tag them, we give them a number, and then we, yeah, we take the basket on our head and we start swimming in the bay, which was a scary part. I, I saw like sharks everywhere. There weren't, people there said there were no sharks. I, I, they said, yeah, behind the reef, but sharks are not like, oh, here's a reef, let's, let's turn around, guys. <laughs> I was like, uh-uh, I mean, okay, but I'll just do it for the sake of science. And my colleague was on the beach, just, <laughs> you're doing great. But at one point, like, people were doing like this and shouting. And I was like, oh, gosh, there must be a shark. <laughs> but they're just not used people swimming there in, in that part. It's a little village, and people are like, oh, nobody swims here. So we were like, wow, what is that guy doing? And I was like, never do that again. I mean, like, <laughs> it was outgoing tide. I had to swim against the tide back. 
and I had like a huge thing. I mean, it's a basket full of heavy seeds. I can tell you, like, if Michael Phelps would have been there, I would have beaten it. Like, <laughs> definitely. I was, yeah, I was scared. <laughs> and then we go and check for the seeds. And you see, we walk the whole coastline to find these seeds back. And sometimes it's very hard to see them. There's one here. Sometimes you see them like this or under an old coral reef. This is three kilometers from the release location. We found one there. Sometimes they're also predated by crabs, and this is what you found back. And this is why my mom doesn't like it. <laughs> I mean, it's not good for the washing machine. So we released them in three different locations here, and this is where we found back the propagules. So we, with the GPS system, we, every time we find one, we tag it, and we, co we relate it to the release location. So we do that for all the release locations. And then we put that in what we call a dispersal distance kernel. And this is pretty interesting. All the ones released in the red dot there, which is in a tidal creek, the wind comes from the east here, and it's blocked by the forest. And we find in two species released, we see like one distance dispersal group. There's like every, every, all the seeds kind of dispersed over the same distance. If we go to the more open waters, we see two groups, one that is very short, the other one long. And the ones in the open area, same thing. And if we look in detail, we see that these are horizontally floating propagules, these are vertical. <coughs> so the floating orientation matters. This is a few high tides, so mean we, we extrapolate over time, we definitely capture a few hundreds of tides. So that's important as well. And this is the first model we built a few years ago. It's very, I mean, very basic. We just water currents, UMV fields of the ocean, and we added wind on top of it. And we gave them different sensitivities to wind, the seeds, like 1% of the wind, 2, 3, 4, 5%. And that's the different colors that you see. So things that were released, let's go to the next slide here. We release seeds here. The black line is a trajectory of a seed that only is, is influenced by water, so zero wind. You see onshore currents push it back to the coast. Offshore wind allows wind-sensitive seeds to go. So these are the wind-sensitive ones, like Heritiera. The vertical ones are more like in the black line. You also have the opposite. Onshore wind can push seeds back on, well, to the land, and then you have the vertically floating ones that are only influenced by the current, they can take off and they go. And yeah, this is also an interesting thing because things can be captured in like eddy currents and given that they have a limited viability period, if you get stuck in there for too long, I mean, you can arrive at the site but no longer be viable. So those processes definitely are important. And then this is a project that I'm unbelievably excited about because we started it a while ago, but also I did it with a very good colleague that's definitely a very good friend, Dustin Carroll. It was one of the coolest collaborations ever. I mean, it's, it's yeah, we'll, we'll dive into it. It's, it's cool. So what we did here is we released seeds over the full biogeographical range of mangroves, so the global approach. And in all the locations we have, we release seeds every hour of a full year. So more than 8,000 releases at one particular point. And we give seeds a floating period of one year. So you would have like about 9,000 of these maps. So released at one hour, let them float for a year. Next hour release, float for a year. And you have like more, let's say 9,000 of those fields. And then we combine those fields on one grid to get a density map that shows us where most of the particles of, or the seeds are moving. We've seen the complex forest part. We didn't include that. We assume what we want to focus here is on long distance dispersal. We assume seeds have left the forest because including the forest part, that's what we're going to do in the future, definitely. But it's a complex thing. There's a ton of stuff that we still need to quantify, a lot of uncertainty. So here is like, the particles that can leave the forest, where can they go? Like, is there connectivity like across the Atlantic, across the Pacific? Is, is that even possible? 
we have genetic data. I'm not talking about genetics today, but we have in our team geneticists that have been looking at the DNA of propagules and, and mother plants, and they've been connecting globally DNA samples, and they found connectivity between populations across the Indian Ocean, across the Pacific, across the Atlantic. Sometimes there's, yeah, one says yes, one says no, so it, it's complicated. So adding this model on top of it, combined with the genetics and the field work, makes it much stronger, makes it much more reliable. And of course, we have the trajectories, but we wanted an approach where we could say, yeah, well, seeds that we release in one location, where do they go? They have, we, we need to be able to show that in a digestible way. Because, yeah, what we did is we used connectivity matrices, where on the x-axis we would have the release location, on the y-axis the arrival site. And we used like the, are you familiar with the Spalding map? which are the eco-regions, the eco-provinces, and eco-realms of the world. So we used that map as, as the basics to give it a conservation and biogeographical uh, component as well. This is what it looks like. I mean, this, this map, or, or this whole uh, structure, has 62 provinces, but it has 232 eco-regions. We tried it with the eco-regions, but the plots were very hard to read because you get like 230 things on the x-axis and the y-axis. It's just not possible. So we went for the provinces. And this is, we'll dive into the details. I will not show you like every name on this thing. These are the abbreviated names, like G would be Galapagos. But let's just connect to the map. So these are, seeds released over the full biogeographical range, one month floating period. This is a density map. You should always think we have 8,000 or nearly 9,000 of those maps. One hour release at hour one, one month floating. Hour two, one month floating. You add up all those maps, this is what you get. This is a density plot. And so you see most of it stays near to the release location. There's no crossing of the Atlantic, definitely not of the Pacific. Indian Ocean as well, but if we go to six months and one year, this is pretty cool. Look at it. We see particles here going and they hit the coast and they're transported north. And we'll, we'll focus on some interesting results. So I show the connectivity matrix here, just for example like this. What you see here is this. So let's, let's look at the map. This is just what it says on this is a simplified way of showing this. Definitely this is cool because genetic studies have found it as well. So we, we kind of back up the whole story. We say, okay, genetics have found connectivity there. Well, we see that it's physically possible. The ocean current can get those seeds there. Also in the Indian Ocean, and this is a very interesting area because only there's like about between 70 and 80 uh, mangrove species globally. Most of them, this is definitely one of the hotspots here with all the islands. And there's a lot of things happening here that are very interesting. And there's a lot of connectivity in the area as well, both in a direct uh, way from here to these locations or in a stepping stone way. And you see this arrow is two directions. That's because of the monsoon uh, effect. So things can go both ways, depending on w when they're released. We released over the full year. That means we release seeds at moments that maybe in the field there were no seeds available. That's the phenology. We didn't include that. We still need to quantify that. And this is also a very interesting one because what we see here is things across the Pacific are connected from these coastlines here, but they jump over Galapagos. So Galapagos is kind of a stepping stone. And all these islands as well in Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, all those little islands are stepping stones to go over this huge expanse of water. It's not like you, you, you do like this, right? I mean, first the seed arrives, you need a population, it takes a generation up and then seeds fall. And then, I mean, it's not the time, you should think of the time span because when I read uh, newspaper, there were a few news releases about this, and it, it feels like things 
go jump and they go there. There's, there's first the whole forest that establishes with new seeds, so it takes a while. But definitely there's connectivity there, physically possible, which, which is surprising. I loved it also because of this. Maybe some of you know the Kamtiki. I've been seeing it in Scandinavia, and it's one, it's, it's one of those books that I read as a kid and I was really fascinated by. Um, so this is Thor Heyerdahl with his um, balsam raft. And they started in, in Cuba, here, uh, in Peru, sorry. And they floated with the winds and the ocean currents, and they ended up here. I, I think it was 101 days. Just to show, he was an anthropologist as well, so he was talking about cultural exchanges between this area and here, these islands. People, I don't think people believed him in the beginning, but he just wanted to show that with these basic rafts, they were able to flow there. And our seeds do that as well. So that's what I liked. When I saw, when I saw this map, I immediately saw this one. And I, yeah, I like it. It's a, it's a nice picture. I mean, it's courageous to go there and just say, yeah, let's just try it. I mean, there's sharks there. <laughs> Some of you will say, what does this guy have with sharks? Well, I think I watched too many of those movies where you see like people floating in the ocean and waving like, oh gosh, no. I love sharks, but I'm just scared of it. <laughs> this is another interesting one, it's Hawaii. And you see, well you don't, you, you might think it's connected here, but it's not connected. So it's totally isolated. There's no, there's no connection here. And that's interesting because we have mangroves on Hawaii. And that's because mangroves have been introduced there in the 80s to stabilize the coast. And they're invasive now, so they're just expanding in Hawaii. But they're not connected with the other population. So I like that one as well. And that's, by the way, also found, maybe you know Sally Wood, she has been doing coral dispersal work. And she also found that Hawaii was an isolated uh, population. And then we have Bermuda, which is kind of a latitudinal extreme. It's, let's say, beyond the latitudinal extremes of mangroves. But we see there's mangroves there, and you see that there's a, a ton of seeds being transported there. And the Gulf Stream makes it a bit warmer. So there's the influence both from the ocean and there's an import from this whole area. This is a bit more complex. We translated it. So for each of those trajectories, we computed the trajectory path length, which can be very complex. Particles can do like this. Or if, if, if this is the start location and we do, we do like this, we can go like this, or we can follow the whole path. And what you see here is the cumulative density function plotted for particles that have a different minimum floating period. So we say you're not allowed to strand within the first day. You're not allowed to strand within three days, within five days. And we also used a, a Monte Carlo like between one and five days. And it's interesting to see here, we see the path length distance and the density. And just look at the horizontal shift. So changing the minimum floating period a little bit, make it one day, make it five days, causes this horizontal shift in the cumulative in the CDF. And most particles strand within 50 kilometers, but if we just change that little thing, there's a huge difference in the whole trajectory path length. Same if we only look at the great circle distance. But then we were like, yeah, let's give the particles also a different maximum floating period. Let's say, let's float them for one month, two months, six months, nine months, 12 months. And that's what you see here. It's, it's the shaded envelope here. And you see that the maximum floating period, the envelope is thicker, let's say, in the longer distance part. So tweaking the short distance has a lot of impact in the, let's say, the first 50 kilometers of the dispersal, while the maximum buoyancy period, and that's definitely important because some seeds float 15 days, others can float for more than a year. So if we just assume, yeah, everything flows for a year, yeah, well, that, that's, that's a mistake. Well, and there's also, we also looked at the, ra the ratio between both, like the path length over the great circle distance. That tells you something about the complexity of the trajectory that, that 
that the particles went through. <coughs> Having said this, nice models, but still a lot of work because there's a ton of things that we didn't quantify yet or that are very hard to quantify. You cannot go to all the mangrove forests in the world and just stand there and say, hey, okay, well, first of May, we have propagules. Second of May, we have propagules. Hey, how is it going in Malaysia? Oh, good, there's propagules here. Oh, I that asks for a huge network. And so I've been, this is, this is a paper that we were about to resubmit tomorrow, I think where we compiled all the data available going from the parent tree, how many seeds per tree, we compile all the data, seeds fall from the tree, when do they fall from the tree, they're retained, they're predated, by which species, by which crab species, um, predispersal mortality due to snail, in, I mean, there's a ton of things. Then we go out of the forest, there's dispersal, there's propagule traits that are important, there's vector properties, ocean current, strength, direction, wind. Uh, we arrive somewhere, there's predation as well. In some locations, predation is 100%, so that means everything that arrives is just eaten away by the crabs, so there's no propagules left for to establish a population. This is a literature review that I did a few years ago, and that's all the locations where we have phenology data, where, we, where someone reported something about between August and let's say November, we have seeds for this species. And we, we compile all that data. And don't, don't look at this, just, I'll just summarize it. 70% of the reported data were associated with the wet season. So precipitation might be, definitely might be something to look at in the future. That's something we'll do. This is also nice. These are all cr crab holes here. Before, we took some leaves, I was there with a good friend, we took some leaves, crunched them, we threw it. All of a sudden, look what happened. All the crabs start to come out. And then they take their leaves and they go inside. So predation, definitely present. And if, for those who doesn't, don't believe me, this is in the most terrestrial part of that particular forest. If we zoom in, these are all crabs. There's thousands of them. And there are different species in different zones of the forest going more to the lower tide, higher tide. Something we need to quantify. This is work from a colleague of mine, work that I really, really like because of, not only because of its importance, but also because of the creativity. And I'll tell you why in a bit. So these are different species and they've been looking at how the seeds float over time. So they start horizontally, then they start to shift vertically and then some sink like here. Some start to refloat. How that happens in the cells, it has to do, we'll, we'll look at it. This is what she did. This is in the lab. So basic floating experiments, but then she went to the hospital and after the hours when there were no patients, they put like young seedlings <laughs> in the CT scan to get this. So we, she did also like Micro, light microscopy, that's what you see here. So very thin slices looking at the cells. Use like, what you see is changes in tannins, in starch. There's a lot of things going on there. And what you see is over the vertical part, if you go from the top, let, let's grab the vertical one. The, the redder, do you say that in English? The redder? The more red? <laughs> the higher the density. Horizontally floating, we see more blue here. If we go to the vertically floating one, we see blue here, light density, but it's definitely denser here over time. So it's in the lower part of the seed that the changes happen at the physiological uh, level. How and why that happens, it's, it's interesting and complex. That's the end of the talk. I wanna thank all the good people on this planet. <laughs> Definitely the Moss Landing Institute for inviting me. I love the place. I want to thank all the people I've been working with, wonderful people. I want to thank uh, Pam Carroll. I have a present for you here. <laughs> Pam Carroll is the mother of Dustin Carroll and she's an artist. This is a study that we did, it's published in, oh, I didn't put it here, sorry, no reference. Shame on me. 
This is a painting from the 17th century from Franz Pott, and it was in the period of the colonies. And when they embarked for their colonies, this was one of the first paintings where we see here, if we zoom, that, that, that box here is a zoom in, we see mangroves here, that's Avicennia species. Why is that cool? Because that particular artist had a very, I mean, he's a Dutch person, and if you know the Dutch landscape paintings, they can be very detailed. They had a very good eye for details. And you can go through the art history, a lot of, we, we found like paintings and drawings of the very same, from the very same point that we've been analyzing them, in many of the cases, no mangroves. This guy who was trained to look at the landscape, captured the social part, but also the landscape part, he even captured far in the background these pencil roots. I mean, that's cool. So that's, that's your present. Do I still have time? I, I, I don't know what time it is. Yeah, let's just go to Dr. Livingstone as well. This is a study that we're doing at the moment where we're wondering if the position that people have towards a particular ecosystem, the way you're related to that ecosystem, does that influence the conservation of that ecosystem? So I work on mangroves. I know why mangroves are important. I ask people in the street, in my village, nobody has a clue what mangroves are. That's okay, because they've never, I didn't know it either before. I was working on Antarctica, so I was like, uh, mangroves, I know there were mangrove, like palynological remnants of mangroves on Antarctica back in time. But then the general perception, if you go through, we've been looking through literature back to the 1600s, so it's one of the side projects we have because we like old books and art, so we combine that passion with our topic. And we went through the whole thing. And what we see is mangroves are often described, this, this is my PhD supervisor, then has this picture on Google Maps. This was the house of Dr. Livingstone preparing his expeditions next to a mangrove forest. <laughs> and this is what he writes. It, it, mangroves are the very hotbeds of fever. If we go through literature, one is buried and smothered in the brackish mud. Irregular roots, chaotically venomous snakes to entangle and choke all creatures approaching them. This is an old, this is, this is, uh, this is, a, this is a Dutch book. So that, that's part of it translated here. But definitely, if you go through the literature, the perception of mangroves is a murky one. It's a murky mangroves. And we're wondering if you go to corals, often more colorful. People, many tourists like diving in, I, I don't know, people like diving in mangroves. Uh, yeah, it's muddy and it's... This is a colleague in Singapore, Dan Fries, who has done a study on, the, well, it's in the colonial period, like manuscripts, and he, he saw that often mangroves were related to disease, to danger, so definitely the perception of mangroves is you can see it in many of those books, it's dangerous. It is dangerous because definitely there are snakes. I had a bad cut because of oyster on my, before last day of the field work. I was super glad that it was like, ah, we're nearly, we're nearly there. And it was one of the safest trips. So we were like just stepping and I was like, ah, oh. and then a colleague said, don't watch, don't watch your leg now. And I was like, oh gosh, no. Huh? Okay, yeah, it happened. So definitely it's, it's a tricky environment to do research in, but that's what we're working on now. And I like this paper that just came up. It's a neurological connection to the landscape. What happens in the brain when we look at a landscape? If you look at those four, and they included mangroves as well. This is an agricultural landscape. Is that more attractive than this or that or that? And Turns out that complexity in the landscape definitely influences the way we perceive and we appreciate the landscape and we're, uh, yeah, willing to spend money on conserving it. So yeah, that's, that's things that I like as well. There's the hardcore science, but there's also these, there's a lot of ways to think about when we want to conserve a system. We don't just need to study it, we also need to think about what do non-scientists think about this system? How, how do they look at it? Not having all the details, not having read all the papers and the books, 
what's what's the thing? Like uh, bad roots or oh, snakes? Yeah, that's not looking good. Well, it is. It's important. And look at it. That's a different picture. So it also depends on the picture. That's beautiful. I mean, that's yeah, that's nice. <laughs> that's different. That's the oysters there. They're razor sharp. And I think that's, oh, that's a, a little plantation in Kenya. Yes, that's it. There was this propagule where only the white part remained. So they would predate it, and then they would be like, uh-uh, that, that's, that's, not, that's not chocolate. That's not, that's not good. I don't think so. I, I'm not sure if they're visually attracted or not attracted by it. I, I, I think m maybe it's rather the smell or the senses when, when they taste like the slight, I mean, the tiniest bit of pain, they're like, mm -mm. That's, that's not what I want. So they leave that little thing there. That was interesting. It was hard to find back, but we, we were like, wow, that's, that's crazy. Okay. Um, there was a pretty recent paper looking on genetic diversity in mangroves in China. Um, and they found that looking at six different species, they had really low genetic diversity. I think the Sonoratia alba had mm -hmm. zero genetic diversity. I was wondering if your geneticists that you know have found similar findings in like the mangroves in Florida or Kenya or anything like that? I'm not aware of, what, do, do you remember the, f do you remember the team? Um, I think it was Yao. Is it, the, is it the um, from Singapore or Malaysia? I'm not sure, they were mostly in Thailand. I can look okay. it up after. Um, but they were kind of looking at in terms of like sea level rise and how genetic oh, diversity yeah, is. Decreased um, due to sudden sea level rise. Well, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if any others. There's definitely studies out there on the genetics in other parts of the world, but I'm not a geneticist. I we work with a team of geneticists. They're trained as geneticists, so I, I'm not aware of other papers. But I think they definitely exist. That was for Sonoracia alba. Um, they looked at six different species. Um, so Ceriops uh, tagal. I mm -hmm. think two of the yeah, we have genetic data for Cereops and Sonoracia as well, and Avicennia marina in Kenya, and I think also for Avicennia in Florida. So yeah, w we should, I, I should give you my email address so you can. <laughs> I think, I mean, I was younger. Oh, God, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was younger. That's what it is. I was younger when I did that field work. And my wife once asked me, would you, would you do the same things again? I'm not sure. <laughs> I doubted when I was answering the question, which means probably Probably because you just like it, you do it. Yeah, it's some things are challenging, like going through through the forest. The, the terrestrial part is okay because you can just walk there. But the more you go to the lower tides, it becomes very muddy. You, you have like there's yeah, there's things there's things there. <laughs> and then you you swim across a tidal creek, but it's not just a, a creek of three meters wide. I mean, at high tide, it's pretty, pretty far. So you need to swim there. And I found like a movie back a few days ago while making this presentation. I was looking for old pictures. And I didn't know I had like my colleague filmed like while I was swimming across the creek. And I was like, wow, it was wider. 
than I had in mind. Like in my head, it was like a small swim, but I was like, no. And it was outgoing tide, and that's the tough thing, because you want to release the seats at the peak of the tide so that there's a maximum that you capture the right moment. And you, you can see where I started and where I ended up at the other side. That was pretty far because I was just drifting away, but I had to swim back. So yeah, definitely, I, I like that part. I like being challenged by, I like going to the limit, let's say, yeah. I like swims against high tide. <laughs> Is it uh, seasonal at all? Is there a right or wrong time to uh, make papules? Yeah, there's, there is seasonality in, in, the, um, in the production of the seeds. Um, Does it make sense weather-wise or uh, current-wise? That's an interesting question because we have, like the study we did, the global meta-analysis of all the studies that ever reported on seed presence in the field, we see a connection with the wet season. We definitely see some seasonality, but what's interesting is some years there's nothing so it's not the, the year before you can see a nice seasonality the year after there's nothing and then again you have a year with seeds so there's also in there's intra and interannual variability and what is driving that exactly i'm not sure there's papers that report on soil salinity there's papers reporting on temperature there's papers reporting on precipitation I definitely think precipitation is a thing in many ways. And I think that because mangroves are terrestrially derived species, meaning more to the, the freshwater end, and they adapted to go to an area where it's a perfect place not to have too much competition from the terrestrial guys, because they're just not, they cannot cope with these very dynamic systems changing. I mean, low tide, high tide, the, 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 salt, the salinity changes a lot. Sometimes it's very dry, very warm, salinity goes up very, I mean, to 60 PSU, sometimes it's five PSU. So I think adding fresh water there must definitely trigger things, I, I think. I mean, that's, that's to be investigated. We, yeah, we need a million of lives to investigate all the cool things on this planet. Thanks for the question. So you mentioned about um, the sea viability during dispersal, so generally how long can they be dispersed and so viable and are you going to attract that during the long dispersal? We're, we're planning to do that. So the paper that we're about to the review, we reviewed all the data there is on this thing going from the parent tree all the way back to a new population, to the establishment part. What we see there is some seeds are viable for 10 days, some are viable for 300 days, depending on species. But also, one of the things we should keep in mind, some of, you wanna capture the maximum buoyancy period. You wanna capture the maximum viability within a batch of propagules. Now, if the maximum viability is 30 days or your maximum buoyancy is 300 days and you let your experiment run for 15 days and you say 80% was still viable, 10% was still floating, you still don't know what the maximum was because your experiment was just not capturing the maximum. So, and that's one of the statements we make in the whole thing because we have this table four pages table full of data, but to capture the maximum, just knowing that some seeds remain viable or buoyant for more than a year, well, setting up such an experiment takes time. You need facility, you need like, okay, we have this place for a full year or longer, and it's, it's ours. We can just do whatever we want. We have experiments done in Malaysia. The data is there. It's somewhere in a folder on the laptop there. Yeah, I should look at it. But there we did an experiment for more than a year, looking also on the floating orientation. But that's rare. Most are very short experiments because it's just difficult to, to do that. 
Thank you.